I just want to make sure that we have on the call, we have Petrus not in here at the moment, um, Trish, myself. Do we have Lettimore Pinkney? No. Lettimore's not coming to help out me in Thursday. So he's probably not coming to go by. Um, Pinkney said he might run late or he might not show up at all. Ripley is here. So we do have Quorum and Ben. Okay, great. All right. Um, and if any. Go then. What's that? Oh, no, you you're need needed. You're needed. <laughs> if anyone, um, just for clarification before we start the meeting, they were, I guess they were having a hell of a time hearing, um, unless you were right up at the table um, on there. So if you are going to speak, um, just pop up at the table, and that way they'll be able to hear you. And we don't have to stop the meeting to ask what was just said a bunch of times. Other than that, let's uh, call to order. Um, August two, 2020 government operations. Um, we do have Lattimore will be excused. Pinkney might be excused um, if he's not here in time. And um, we'll start with the minutes to approve. Move the minutes. Moved by Ben, seconded by Petrus. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Carried. Um, Brittany is uh, either Cheryl or Kate or anyone on from the Board of I'll Elections. The, oh, from Board of Elections? No. I thought you were from the legislature. I don't know. I know. Okay. But, um, no. Judging from the report, they are um, taking some time off in August. They said that they just got done with the primary elections and they're kind of gearing up for uh, the presidential election in August might be their only slow month of the entire year. So. Maybe they're golfing or, you know, all the fun stuff you do when you don't have to. Playing on the beach. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so does anyone have any questions for them that I can pass along? All right. If not, we will move along. No, I just talked to her. What was, was she golfing? No. Oh, okay. Um, I'll take uh, Amanda. You are on. Alrighty, good evening. Uh, so unfortunately, we will not uh, be able to do employee recognition or student government day this year due to the pandemic. Um, just getting crowds of people together like that, obviously not a good idea. So we uh, will be holding off on those this year. And that also means the October uh, legislature meeting will be at 6 p.m. Uh, instead of the 10 a.m. student gov time. So just keep you guys up to date with that yeah. okay um, thank you those were like my favorite meetings too especially the student yep. in, um, like the best but uh, does anyone have any questions for the clerk's office all right uh, thank you Amanda thank you Chris Palermo you are up no updates from the committee it's been uh, you know pretty as routine as we can get during uh, during the current crisis, um, so, but the work hasn't really changed. It's uh, real estate transfers, several of which are working on and uh, making progress. Um, contracts, resolutions. Um, I guess probably the biggest thing that came out of the office this month, and it'll be on the Ways and Means agenda, so I, not really for this committee, but is the sales tax extension, the additional one percent on our sales tax for another three years. That resolution will be coming to the Ways and Means Committee for approval. It will be approved here. School board will go to the state, and that will get us another three years of flood money. So that's probably yeah. the biggest. Yeah, it's huge. Okay, any questions for the county attorney's office? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Chris. Next up, Sue, are you on? I don't know. She, I think she uh, is on vacation this week. That's right, too. So she submitted what is relatively a lengthy report. Um, does anyone have any questions that I can pass along to her? Um, I feel like there was something I wanted to mention, and I cannot remember what it was. Although I will say that I uh, was thinking about getting my motorcycle license. And I went and had to go apply for my learner's permit, and I have to take the test and all that fun stuff. So, and that was an interesting experience with the appointment system. And I waited on line outside. 
um, to talk with somebody to figure out what I had to bring with me and how much it was going to be and all that fun stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, there, it's, it's, you know, they, there's like 20 people that congregate in front of our county office building on any given day because they're waiting in line for the DMV. And I actually asked that um, to see um, if, if it was anyone's for the clerk's office or maybe they're waiting in line for DSS or something. No, they were for the DMV. And I was, I was pretty impressed by that. So It'll be better in January when it's 15 degrees out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. hopefully we're reopened because, you know, we can't have that going on for too much longer. But, you know, that's a different problem for a different day. Trish, did you have something? Just a comment that, um, and this is maybe, uh, in terms of social media and stuff like that, I, I just know that like DMV doesn't have a social a, its own Facebook page or anything like that. And um, I know Sue's been doing a lot through her own personal Facebook page with promoting what's going on with the DMV um, and stuff. But just something I think we should look at, you know, for county departments that. Um, different ways to get information out there in this day and age, and social media is an important one. Um, it could certainly help to streamline questions and respond to questions, you know, frequently asked questions and stuff if we did something a little bit more um, formal through the county. Yeah, um, so. that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Let's, um, well, well, I'll ask her about it and see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, I've talked to her a little bit. I mean, there's definitely concerns about how do you how are you going to manage it and things like that. But they're managing a lot of those calls and stuff. Yeah, I in other she, ways. So. She was responding on Twitter to questions about DMV and clerk's office stuff when they were closed down and people had questions. And I was like, okay, I assume that was maybe a county account, but it was maybe her personal account. So it would be helpful to get that moved over. All right, uh, barring no more questions for that office, we will move on to, um, keep going. Paul Bornman, are you on the call? I just spoke with you, so I know. I am on the call. How are you? I'm okay, how are you? Good, good to see you again. Um, so I submitted uh, our report uh, for the month of August. Uh, in July and August, uh, to summarize, uh, we spent a lot of time working with New York State Board of Elections on cybersecurity. Uh, at the, uh, a grant that New York State is putting together for the counties to uh, shore up their uh, security and protections for the upcoming election and future elections. To again make sure that uh, that, that the, uh, the residents are all. Uh, confident in the uh, elections and the quality of the data that's being received uh, we have uh, we have work to uh, to do based on their assessment and what uh, we're uh, on schedule to get about eighty thousand dollars of grant money from New York State um, and I have a budget for that that's been submitted to the uh, uh, New York State Board of Elections along with the uh, folks from the uh, Board of Elections Department at the county so um, it, once that's approved, we will uh, then submit a resolution to accept those those dollars and put the and uh, and act. Right. Um, uh, we've, we've also been busy working with the Munis upgrade uh, with the uh, county treasurer's department. They've been spending a lot of time in uh, training people on how to use the uh, new version of Munis uh, for the county, and that's been moving along. And we expect to go live in September. Uh, with that new version of Munis after the training is completed. Yeah, and I don't know if the legislature understands that was kind of a huge process to undertake um, that we worked on part of it in the IT work group um, that we've been having meetings about. And, um, you know, we had to draw in the treasurer's office because they depend heavily on Munis and I mean, really every county department. But um, without that upgrade, it was uh, heading towards being obsolete and we would have been up a brick without a paddle. That's correct. The uh, the Munis, uh, the version we were on did not support reporting in 2021. So we uh, we were under the gun to upgrade before 2021. And then the version we've upgraded to is only good for two years. So we'll have to do the upgrade again. Again, there's uh, yeah. the upgrade is covered by our maintenance contract with, with Tyler. 
Um, but uh, there's a lot of work involved in configuring and training staff to use features. Okay, great. Um, okay, and I know that you've been doing some work on the multifunction printers for the entire county, and that's uh, the printing station in every department and all that. Do you want to just give us a brief update on that? Sure, absolutely. So I've been working with Don Carr um, under his, uh, his leadership from a procurement perspective. Um, we've looked at both um, using an existing contract versus going to bid. And we believe very strongly that going to bid would not uh, benefit us uh, in any way. That uh, going on to an existing contract that's much larger than ours, um, for example, Toshiba, the current uh, incumbent vendor, uh, they have a very large contract with Onondaga County, which we are able to uh, associate with. And the pricing was much better than what we're currently paying. And then we also looked at another competitor, uh, Xerox, uh, who is currently providing services to both the hospital and the, uh, the college locally. And uh, we looked at their contract for both these and we're able to go on to that contract if we want to. So we are comparing uh, their proposals and under those contracts. And we believe that we're gonna be able to save the county money. And once we understand the we'll look for support from the legislature to um, to move forward with one of those decisions based on the best value and um, and we believe that we can also make further cutbacks in the number of prices and possibly volume of of uh, printing over uh, the next year so we hope to save the county more money even further reductions and efficiencies okay great um, anything else for us before we uh, ask for questions? Uh, those are the big things. The electronic uh, forms that we're using to uh, do our COVID screening at the county office building and the public safety building and all the other facilities. So we're getting a, about a 50 or 60 percent utilization on versus doing paper forms. Um, those are all encrypted uh, forms from using Formstack. And we're in the process of... Uh, upgrading that to a fully HIPAA compliant uh, version of Formstack. But currently it's all encrypted and uh, under their HIPAA, uh, under, under our HIPAA guidelines. Okay. Okay, any questions for Paul or his department? Okay, great. Um, so Paul, before you, you leave, I just want to give, I guess the committee an update on where we stand with the IT work group. Um, we have been meeting monthly um, except for a few months where COVID had just taken over everything and um, his time was much more valuable spent with that. So uh, we did meet for approximately two hours prior to this meeting. Um, and what that committee is essentially for is um, to utilize high level um, direction from the IT department, if you remember back to, I wanna say January, February, um, their contract had lapsed and we we had to kind of just move it forward for this year to try to get ahead for the next contract that we do with our, with either them or um, another um, entity for our IT department. So with that said, uh, first thing is first is making sure that IT stays uh, on budget um, within within their budget that we have planned for them this year, um, especially with COVID related expenses, it's not easy, um, but it's a work in progress, just like everything else. So far, Paul says that they should be able to stay on on par for that. Um, if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to reach out, but we're looking, so far we're looking pretty good. And uh, next month we're going to have a projection for the rest of the year to make sure that it comes in in budget that's one um second is we had discussed um the the direction of it in terms of what their 2021 contract will look like and um discussions that we talked about a few options that he had presented to us um there was favorable opinions of one particular option that um, people thought was was good which was um, moving um, some pieces around in the IT department 
um, scaling back some hours at the at the high end, moving other people uh, up, and um, allowing some administrative experience for other staff. Um, so that plan is um, it's a transition plan for the rest of the year on how it will look. Um, it's going to be presented to us next month, and uh, it, it's a, it's being worked on, which is good. And if that's successful, then IT will start with that plan into 2021. Um, we'll likely approve or we'll discuss um, what it will look like for 2021's contract and maybe potential for a director at some point, um, as someone that we can bring in as a county staff person that can then make the decisions for the department to contract out with um, for the county's IT staff or otherwise. And right now it's it's Paul and his staff are doing a great job, um, but we don't, um, it's with any um, business that you contract out for, you, you're unsure of um, the authority that they can have within the county uh, and the ecosystem that is there. So. Uh, if anyone has any questions on that, please get a hold of me, send me an email or anything like that, and we'll talk about it. But that was the direction that I, I solicited from, I think, the past couple of section, ex, executive sessions we've had the past couple of months, and we're moving forward with it. And Paul was gracious enough to say, okay, yeah, that sounds great. And so we're going from there. Elaine. Yep. Are you talking about whatever format or plan that you'll plan for in 2021 through how you allocate the budget is that right, right. yes so you'll, you'll you'll sort of think this through and then budget appropriately for it next year yes exactly right okay. and and also on how we're going to proceed with 2020 um and you know just making sure we're staying on top of, of what the our spending the, for this the year. spending is and the you know the staff agrees. So, uh, yes, all of, all of the above, because it realistically, in order for there to be any accountability of, I think, of the legislature, we need to approve a contract this year during our budget season for next year. And in that direction, plan that we know what we're going to get, how long we're going to have it for, and, and um, for what amount, right? And so it's like, we need to put more happy discussions now for that and where everything stands. I mean, it's, you know, it's a work in progress. But they're starting now as opposed to starting in January of next year. Uh, any other questions for Paul? All right, Paul, thank you so much. Thank you. Next up is someone from the veterans office. Lindsay, are you present? She's there. Is that her? She's Lindsay, you're muted. Yeah. She muted, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, you're muted now. You'll have to unmute her. Okay. Well, what's that? Hello? Oh, there we go. Yeah, okay, we hear you now. Good. <laughs> Good afternoon. How is everyone? Doing uh, Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, John was, uh, he's brought back from Berlin. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's cutting out. Oh, she's eating Okay. All right. Well, um, okay. the last thing we heard was that John was brought back from furlough. Correct. And the transportation is back on the road. So we are practicing social distancing and also um, out of 15 riders, there's only four that can go at this time with one wheelchair and it's been full every day. Okay, that's good, that's good. And 
the VA is starting to set up compensation claims. So there's a huge backlog. I don't know if you have received any phone calls for the de delay, um, but they are starting backup compensation and continuing telehealth. Okay. If I do, I will uh, forward them on to you. Yes, thank you. And all three of us uh, in the office, uh, we are attending high annual training through New York State Division of Veteran Services to maintain our accreditation to do the job. And um, Jessica still should be back next month. Is is that's what she said. Yeah. He's been out since March, March to September, and working in um, Syracuse at the 174th base. That's great news. Huh. That's such great news. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, any questions for Lindsay? No. No. All right. Lindsay, thank you so much. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to her. All right, we do have one resolution tonight yes, please. Thank for um, GovOps. And um, before we get on to this, I do want to explain it real quick because there was a lot of material attached um, to it that confused some folks. So we have constantly said um, over at least this year about the need, certain legislators have said, we're passing um, a resolution in it that doesn't have any amounts uh, listed for what the account that the funds are supposed to come out of. How how much is left in that account? So I know, you know, if we're taking a hundred thousand dollars out of it, and um, I know how much is in there. Okay, so I said to Chris, Chris, can you draw something up? Um, he drew up this specific resolution, which is the first resolution. At some point, what was attached was the entire resolution process document um, that we don't really, I mean, necessarily need to have to be in order to be able to pass this. Um, we are amending that policy um, just to stick this in there that we are requesting the amounts um, of, of the accounts be, be placed in the resolutions going forward. Um, so that's why this is on here. So I have received um, a bunch of questions from various legislators that's, that uh, had concerns about the actual resolution policy. Okay, so we don't have to necessarily update the entire policy in order to um, put in our request to have the resolution amounts in there. Um, we can work on those. You can submit them to Chris. We'll, he'll collate all of them, and uh, that can be in just an update of policy as we go forward. I think that would be the simplest way to do it. Um, if you have any concerns about it or otherwise, uh, send them to Chris uh, or myself and I'll send them to Chris. So um, with that said, uh, I will take a motion for GO1. Motion. Motion by Charlie, seconded by Petrus. Any discussion on that? Okay. Um, I'll, yeah, go for it. I just um, was curious. Th is this the policy that every department head follows right now for mm -hmm. resolutions? And um, it se seems like it was fairly a little bit convoluted a little bit. I don't know if there's been any feedback on this. Um, I was trying to follow it myself. and uh, it's, uh, I, I think the policy is from 2015, actually. It's, uh, yeah, effective date February 24, 2015. Um, and this is just section 41 of the county policy manual. But you know, when questions come up, I mean, that's where the first place we look is you go to the clerk of the legislature's website and there's county policy. And you know, you look to see what's been um, department heads for the most part, it's difficult for them to try to go back and find resolutions from several years ago. You know, I think that's the danger of putting in these directives and just a resolution. How, where, how, do they, how do they even find them, you know? It's difficult. So having a policy manual is very helpful to the employees here. Um, unfortunately, they don't, uh, we just did the purchasing policy. That was over 10 years old. They don't probably get the attention that they need. Um, 
and there's an awful lot of policy. Like I said, there's, there's over 60 different policy documents in there. So those help you look at them when it comes to yeah, and, uh, yeah. I mean, I noticed just the authorization to fill forms outdated. That's not the one that's currently being used now. So that's what was confusing me as to where is this, this is old stuff that probably, probably should be looked at and cleaned up for replacement documents. Yep. Yeah. Chris, can we, uh, I have Charlie next. Um, Charlie. A couple of nasty words in here probably ought to be taken out. Okay. Just and, and you can imagine what they are. Genoa. Huh? You know, <laughs> <Democrat. laughs> does, does it matter that we don't have one? I mean, or does that? Oh, the admit, reference to the administrator. Oh, the, the reference to the reference to the request to fill right. and approval of. And I mean, as, so let, let me just let me just do this. Done. I'll work with Charlie. Uh, should, or, can it be the chair of the legislature or designee? Yes. I'll right. Yeah. I'll. I'll let me collect all of your things because I saw Trisha got it, and that's cool. Um, and send them out. Lane, I'll get yours, and I'll get Charlie's, and anyone else. Um, and we'll we'll update this policy for next month, um, and we'll bring it forward to the committee, and you know, in its entirety, with a list of differences that we that we put in there, like. I mean, the, the authorization to fill form is from 2015, so we'll just put 2020s in there, change, swap out some of the names. I saw like names that were in there of old legislators, uh, stuff like that. Um, yeah. And was Paul looking at form stack potentially as an approval m method for some of this stuff that? Um, uh, at one point, I think he was looking into it. It probably got. Um, sidetracked but um that would be beneficial right so we can look at that but i don't want to i don't want to like throw too much at it let's get the, the policy to where it needs to be first and then we can worry about the process of the policy that it that it states charlie okay one more statement yeah having the account numbers and the balances there is supreme yeah it's a fantastic yeah, definitely. Huh. Mm. All right. Any any other um, questions for GO one? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed. All right. Carry. So I don't think we have any other business on the agenda now. Something I heard about policy, I think it was last night, um, was that, and I'll just mention this before we adjourn the meeting, um, was that the sheriff had talked about he had um, two resolutions that the full legislature had passed last year um, but he had never filled and they were authorizations to fill with people he had never actually filled them at that time um, you know he wanted to see how things would shake out in his department uh, and he wanted to make sure that they were still valid so he brought them forward last night um, just to make sure the committee still approved um, and the committee said, yeah, you already had your authorization to fill from the entire legislature. You don't need to, we don't need to revote on those resolutions. Um, but it was suggested that maybe we do have a policy um, that says authorizations to fill run out after a year or something if you haven't filled them. Um, you know, I mean, it could be a six months, it could be whatever, but I'm going to work with Chris maybe to put something together for that. Uh, and I just wanted to run it past everybody. Elaine. No, I just, I mean, I just thought it was an unwritten rule that if it was quite old, you really needed to like, do what we did last night, which is say we'll still honor it or, I mean, because, I mean, how old, it's seven years old. Yeah. Right. right. I mean, so yeah, right. I, don't, I, I think it was more of an unwritten rule that, you yeah. know, something that old, maybe HR was looking at that. I don't know. But. Right. Um, ben. It might be, uh, could they expire in the fiscal year that they were done? That way, it would make the budgeting process a lot easier. And if something was like close yeah. to the end in the resolution, you might want to say that it stays in for the next year. But for budgeting purposes, I think it'd be really a lot cleaner if they were expired. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Chris, you that we can work on that. Um, we can, you know, I. I I guess I don't know enough about the various departments. One thing that pops in my head is the sheriff, right? Does he get the resolution and then send them off to the training academy? And what if they don't finish? And 
or does he come back for another resolution or does he I, I guess I just don't yeah. and I think uh, with your department the people that go out for people that don't make probation probation that's another question you know right. there's an authorization and you, you hire right. somebody and, and they're only here for two months and you have to terminate them. right does that resolution still give you the ability I, I don't know right. I guess I just need to let you know yeah, a lot of that nine one one too. Yeah, right. Cut it. Right. Well, we'll work on it and try to get those nuances, capture them all, and see if we can do it or not. All right. Uh, anything else to come before the committee? Motion to adjourn. Motion by Ben, seconded Second. by Petrus. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Good. You too, ben. Wonderful. All right. Okay. Unless you want to wait here. Oh, yeah. That's the earliest ever. I think that we've got. Good job, Ryan. Huh. Oh, <laughs> when we only have one head. I don't know. I don't know. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Oh my god, I didn't mean to break it. Oh my god, I didn't mean to break it. Oh my god, I I know, but you know, it's like, um, so you learn if you hurt, like, uh, you learn what's your deal. Oh, I see what you're saying. And I haven't even done my CBT test yet. And you're fine. Yeah, you're Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Do I have to, Brittany, do I have to sit somewhere that can be seen? No, as long as you speak loud enough. Okay. If you project, no. I got it. <laughs> I definitely got it. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. I just want to talk about the long time. Listen, I got a pair of jeans on well, it's good to see it out there. It was a very well made. But I'll be thinking of it. I get caught up in something. Lucky lately to get out of here. Yeah, yeah. So I think you guys are really fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I guess the timing of their misbehavior. It's not lining up with what I have to do. Like, I mean, I'll like sooner or later, so I have to do it. I like to do it. Yeah, you can make it out. I think yeah. Uh, no. Or yeah, I'm on this committee too. Oh, you got a seat. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we. We'll go. And let's do it at six fifteen. Okay. All right. I'll go to it. That's what they keep telling me. Hey, hi. Is Gavin coming back or not? Because it's the truth. I had one of the first right. moving, so I don't know. Well, I'll let yeah. you know. I'm still going to be able to talk. Okay. To I mean, I'll go. Yeah, okay. like 20 days, and then watching the session. Sure, just send it out. Yeah, yeah. And so that's not really helpful. Good. 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 Every group that they do, and I don't know which makes it work. There's not one, no, there's not one. I want to sell all of them. So, you gotta just be you gotta be you gotta let yourself chat, right? Come through so people like people don't want you to want to know that you're real oh. because no matter what you they don't have to talk to you, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, 
tell, starts off very way is where the real learning is. You, you know what I mean? That's what, that's that's the way it is. That's what it's everybody, everybody here is good at that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah. Except the committee meeting. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of relevance. <laughs> That treatment team thing going where you got to go in front of like eight people. To, 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 that used to be like that over there. Like when, when you guys say, you know, the therapist saw someone and then it was you know, the treatment the treatment plans due in 30 days and every 90 days you'd have to go in front of like it's a panel yeah. to, to, to defend what you oh. wanted to. Yeah. No, I don't think that's like that anymore. Yeah. We still have all that. We still have the treatment plan and I think the comp plan. After. Yeah, there, 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 there's some um, draft regulations to do away with that. Yeah. Particularly the psychiatrist signing the treatment plans, because I'll tell you what, in a week at County Mental Health, there's got to be, I don't know, 800 treatment plans signed every week. And you really think that docs are reading them? No. no. That's what I mean. No. No, no, no. Right. Yeah. Tell me that they're reading Yeah, yeah, sure. I never trust the psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I would have wanted to do that over again, I would probably would have wanted to be like a nurse practitioner or something like. I think the nurse practitioner is one of the best gigs. Yeah, it's a lot less schooling. They have the same, I mean, ability. They actually like it, it, it used to be that they had to always have a collaborating physician. But I think what's I don't remember. It's either if they once they get their license and they're working with a collaborating physician after two or three or four years, something they don't have to have them. Anymore. And I think they're going to try and make it the nurse practitioners assign the medication patient treatment plans, which would be really helpful to clinics because then you wouldn't be so pressured on psychiatrists on right. staff. You know? Right, that would be awesome. I think they're realizing that the regulations mm -hmm. need to be. People are concentrating too much on the paper part of it right. than they are the. That is really what it is. I mean, I've obviously experienced that where it's like, it's like a lot of writing. It's, it's, you know? And then try to be brief in what you're writing. Uh, and it's like, but you got to do it for every, when exactly. you're doing it like 10 times a day. Yeah, exactly. And on top of that, all the administrative effort in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a clinic to. Make sure. Make sure people know what stuff is doing because you're not going to always be able to see that when you're seeing patients all the time. You can get lost right, yeah. in the work. So. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's almost what you want for a certain extent, but I've thought, I've thought about this a lot. Of time. This table bullshit. I, I, I realize that. <laughs> I realize, sorry. Um, that's, that's, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I would have done that too. Oh, man. Um, I, I don't know what you know. But um, no, I was like, this is nuts. You know, I realized that there's probably a great need to have this stuff in documentation. Well, if it's done right, it helps you stay focused on the treatment, yeah, so you exactly. know where you're going and what you're doing. And but then that collaborative time. business with the patient so they can see where you are. Right. But you know, you have to, it's like, you know, I mean, even the intake forms are crazy. We stripped a lot of it away over the years. I remember when I, when I got there, I mean, I don't know how it is over there, but a, a therapist yeah. never touches a fax, never writes a letter, never sends out records, never never does any of that. Stuff. That's all done for like seeing patients. In fact, we we converted a men's room into a women's room so they wouldn't I mean, they put flowers in the urinals, plastic flowers, and change them by the seasons for, for, for the therapist. Too. Just because it saved them, that was one idea, it saved them steps or walk them. Didn't have enough time between patients to go in the bathroom. So no. like, well, right, yeah. I mean, that's that's because of the pressures of the patients and the paperwork. Right, right, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, that's the thing. Like, you know, you have a 45 minute session, you have 15 minutes to get your paperwork, your, your progress in order. But your session is going 55 minutes. You know, you don't really have enough time to. That's why we make them do it concurrently. Yeah. Right. So you're doing the note with the patient. People say that takes away from, you know. That's what everybody says, but that's, that's, there's somebody's got something to say about everything. But in terms of a change like that, that but it's really, if you do it right, patients don't feel bad about it at all. They like it because it makes them feel more engaged in their treatment. They go over the note, they get to ask questions, and then they sign. Careful. <laughs> so, yeah, it keeps, right? You're one of these. Probably. Oh, he's not. Oh, he's not. Okay.
Oh, I gotta tell you, it's so hard to wear this mask. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if I'm gonna talk, it's gonna be more possible. Lane, I am yeah. here. Oh, good. It is okay, good. Good thing I didn't say anything bad about you. Yeah, well, I, I was listening earlier. Oh, you were? <laughs> and I'm okay, whatever. <laughs> I, heard, actually, I didn't hear anything, but I read your thoughts. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I don't. I, can we just call the meeting to order? Yeah. Do we have a quorum? Okay. Well, wait well, for you if you want. With you want Keith, that would be four. So. Yeah, you have a quorum. Yep. Because I don't believe uh, Tim or Mike are coming tonight. I know Mike's been excused, and Tim uh, let me know he wouldn't be available. Is Hans around though, or no? Hans, or, uh, Hans is not on the committee any longer. Keith took his place. That's correct. That's correct. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, we can call the uh, Health and Human Services meeting to order. We have two appointments tonight, and a total of now it might be eleven resolutions. Um, and we do have an executive session also scheduled on the agenda. I was thinking maybe we could. Um, get through the appointments and then go through the resolutions and then have time to uh, have departments highlight any information they want from their report or ask departments any questions that we might have. So uh, first there's a, if we could get a motion to approve the minutes from last month. Okay, Heidi second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Um, there, as I said, there are two appointments tonight, one to the mental health Committee and one to the Alcohol and Substance Abuse Committee. I'll this move the appointment. All right, great. And um, any second for those appointments? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Great. All in favor, then. Um, if. Yep. Aye. Oh, all in favor? Yep. Yeah. All right. Thanks. If so, if we could get to the resolutions tonight. Um, I was looking at the under the health department, there's HH1289. I was thinking maybe of grouping together HH1, 2, and 8, and then getting a motion to move those all at once. HH1 would be authorizing the health department to enter into a contract with the state to accept $14,403 for uh, the pedestrian wheel sports safety, part of their injury prevention. HH2, allowing the public health director to enter into five-year agreements with a, ver a variety of colleges or universities to host interns, and this this would avoid them having to come um, single by single when those opportunities come up. And then number eight, which had gone through um, HHH, which had gone through the hiring committee, authorizing the health department to fill two lactation peer counselor positions. These are $12.23 uh, cent an hour positions. They're required by the grant, um, the WIC grant, to have lactation peer counselors. And there were, are vacancies in those two positions, and this would allow uh, them to recruit and fill those uh, positions. I will move those as a bundle. Ms. Keith. Okay, thank you. Second. All right. Any questions about them? Okay. Um, I was just wondering uh, if we could get a little background on that Cuga County Council on Physical Fitness, what that is all about. I know it involves the Council on Physical Fitness and Joe Mushak, who's been a long-term contractor with the health department for years. He's done a lot of the injury prevention work, hosted this bicycle there, and, and you know, a, a number of um, injury prevention initiatives. He used to be a, a a school employee and that's how we ended up coming here but these are small dollars but instead of doing the work themselves they pass the money through this council on physical fitness and he executes the work plan thank you that's pretty much still correct right. yeah. okay um hh uh nine if we could uh get it I, this is authorizing the cuba county legislature to enter into an agreement for did and we, fill oh sorry did, we bundled them. Okay. Can and then discuss. We just do the vote. All right. Need a vote. All right. Can we get a vote on HH1, 2, and 8? Aye. Aye. All right. Any? All right. Great. Thanks. Thanks for keeping me honest. 
Um, HH9, again, is, uh, this didn't go through the hiring committee, but my understanding it was discussed with Aileen, uh, Keith and Paul, majority minority leader. They had looked at various options of how to get this health screening done for people entering the building, whether it be our staff or eventually the public. And this appeared to be a recommendation from Aileen and the best option in terms of moving forward. It would allow the health department to create and fill three part-time health uh, public health screening assistant positions. They'd be $16 an hour, and there are COVID-related funds coming into the health department to offset the cost for them. My understanding from Lisa, I guess, and Aileen could clarify, they're going to be starting and uh, hoping to staff the building from seven to nine in the morning, and then potentially their role will be expanded as needed and as funds allow. Yeah. Okay. yeah, currently right now we have staff self-screening with a temperature, and they're at answering a questionnaire online. Um, and we would like to further streamline that so that we don't have folks handling the uh, thermometers and having to wipe them off. So we just want to get people in the building efficiently and safely. Um, so we feel as though this is the best case scenario. This was our plan C. Plan A was to have folks internally maybe volunteer. That is asking a lot from our employees. Um, second, we tried to do some more of um, a contract situation uh, with uh, expert staffing uh, companies as well as any other entities like the hospital. Um, that wasn't going to work out either, so here we are with staff sort of last resort to be fun to be uh, cost conscious in this effort. And now we have the COVID funds that we can offset this expense. And you know here we are we're, we're, we are uh, all with this. So unfortunately initially we thought oh maybe this would be a few months but you know, we're not sure we think it's gonna be a long term thing. So that's that's where that's how it arrived okay. Can um, motion? someone make a motion for HH9? I'll move it. Second. Second. Um, any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'll raise here tonight also um, if there's any additional questions, but we'll move on to the mental health resolutions. HH3. HH10, and if I'm not mistaken, um, we'll be adding HH11, uh, we which just, is the we second. Until today right. It was a little more complicated resolution yeah. right until the second edition. On the, um, on the original agenda, and I reached out to Ray and asked who there was only, well, let's go to HH3 first. Um, that's uh, to amend the 2020 uh, state aid uh, allocations coming into the uh, mental health clinic. And my understanding is this is done to reflect changes made in state aid in the various uh, categories and allocations. After the budget was submitted, some changes were required, and this just kind it of clean, cleans here. it up. Um, can I get a motion mm -hmm. to HH3? Second? One second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Yeah, Elaine, I have a question, if I may. Okay. So um, I have had some email exchanges, so I do understand what we're looking at here, and I appreciate the the, uh, the information that Ray and staff provided. So thank you. The um, my question is how how we will handle the the other changes that have been discussed in terms of holding our not for profit partners harmless with the reduction the twenty percent reduction in in uh, uh, state aid. Is that going to be by resolution or? Uh, well, how is that going to be handled, I guess, is my question. Because this does not handle that, as I understand it. So I don't think we need a resolution to... Can you come up there? Because no one can hear if they're listening. It, it's hard to hear if you're not here. Thank you. I could just project from here. Okay, project away then. <laughs> So we have so the, the the contracts that we have with the agency is call for the the full funding amount that was available in 2020. So we have authorization to pay them up to that amount, and we can adjust it down if we want to, based on you know what happens with the state aid. So we have some state aid that's not appropriated that we're going to use to make them whole. So the state aid um, 
isn't appropriated and it's free to use. So, you know, the community oh. board sort of understands that we're um, allocating the funding that way. So there's enough there in that unallocated state aid to be able to make those agencies whole without using state aid that goes into the clinic from the same funding source. And we can right. do that. We're committing to do that to the end of 2020. Okay. And then the contracts, that, and that was kind of, I think you've answered my question. The contracts we have with the agencies, simply the the they do not the, the they they specify what um what state aid they will get so the only time we would have to modify that is if we actually reduced the amount is that true is that what i understand no gave more if we gave more there's language in the contract that says you'll only be paid like the, the contract for a hundred thousand dollars but there's language in there that says if the county gets less state aid you're going to get less so that the right we, wouldn't need to amend, we wouldn't need to amend that. It just happens that way. If you wanted to make that contract $110,000, we'd go to the community services board. They would vote on allocating $10,000. We'd come here, do a resolution to amend the contract, and then do, then, then do a new one. So. Right. But because the contract says, to use your numbers, the contract says we, we will provide $100,000 the um unless we need to reduce it for state aid because because we're still going to provide a hundred thousand then that contract is in effect and we don't have to do anything right no reason to yeah thanks thanks i was confused about that i have a quick question okay um the unallocated state aid is that um a pool that you we typically have from one year to the next so the only reason it's unallocated is we had <laughs> we had we're going to contract with Liberty. So that money was going to be contracted with Liberty Resources to do respite. So when the time came to talk to Liberty Resources about doing respite, COVID happened. So they're like, we can't start any new programs now. This isn't a really good time. So I was like, oh, oh, okay, fine. Then um, kind of both things happened at the same time. So then talking to Liberty and they're like, all right, we'd like to talk about this. And, and I'm like, well, with the state aid cuts, I'm not sure this is a good time. I wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't be able to get enough money to really do it anyway. So I'm like, let's just hold off on this for now. That's the unallocated state aid. The rest so by the, it, like, there's going to be a balance in that state aid, like make the agencies whole for the third and fourth quarter. So there's, let's like. You, you sent me an email, $1.2 million of state, OMH state aid, and the 20% was like $252,000. Annualized, yeah. That, that hit, you had to find, either cut those particular agencies those or find another way to continue to fund them at the same level. Right. So we have so we have this, like, it's 100 and I think that contract with Liberty is going to be like $108,000, and we were going to end the contract with Unity House for a respite bed there, put the two piles of money together, which would be enough to have funded you know, that particular project. So when all of this happened, just told Liberty, we're not going to do it this year. There's not enough money to pay you. They're like, fine, we get it. And kept the contract with Unity House. So we still have the respite bed. And then, so there's about $90,000. So when I say unallocated state aid, that $90,000 is, is not funding a program. So right. we'll use that money to make the agencies whole and whatever balance that is, we'll just dump into the clinic. And we've talked to OMH about this and they're all, they're all, they're all good with that. Um, on the OASIS side, you know, the same thing, there, those cuts that were 31%, right? That, that's been changed now to about a 20% cut to be more in line with what happened with OMH. We're not able to help the OASIS agencies because we don't get state aid that we can reallocate, but I have some flexibility in in, in how we fund the programs that we're funding. So for the third quarter, we pass the cuts along. So the cuts affect Unity House, Grace House, right? The halfway house for, for, for men and women who are in recovery. It affects the, the clinic at Chad and it affects prevention at Chad, which is a school-based thing. So they know that in the fourth quarter, so they sent all their stuff and we're gonna look at that. And in the fourth quarter, we, may, we have the flexibility to make some adjustments and move the money around and make one program whole versus another because of utilization and all of that sort of stuff. So that's going to end up happening too. But it's the same sort of thing. Their contracts don't need to be changed because their contracts are will pay you up to this amount of money if there's state aid available. So the agencies all know that we're going those sort of discussions. It's not a good time for, no, this, and, for that and, stuff. And, and it was a concerted effort on your part to be as flexible as you could so you didn't have to put those cuts through if you didn't have to without 
being difficult for the county's budget. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, no, it does. There's no impact on the right. county budget. And then obviously 2021, we don't really what's going to happen. We're not getting any signals. Mm -hmm. It's too early. I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen. Yes. What would have normally happened for the unallocated amount that you would have? Oh, I would have, there wouldn't be an unallocated amount. It would have been a contract. We would have, we would have put it into the service. You would have, okay. It would have gone to something. We, we it was going to go to, in this case, Liberty Resources for an adult right. peer respite home. Right. And, and and we were ready to do it. And then, boom, this hit. And then they're like, we can't start any new programs. So the money just, so we just, it just sat there. Okay. And then concurrently, when they were ready to go, 20% cut was there. Which would have made not enough in that contract to fund that program anyway. So it makes sense to start somebody with not enough money to run the program mm -hmm. at the expense of the ones that were already kind of operating that we're running. Right. Just just was that kind of a decision, you know what I mean? Right. So that's like an annual contract that you would have with them or it's so all these contracts are um, I think we we I think we make them three years now and, and we will do an addendum if there's a change. So there's no contract with it. Okay. We never signed one. For that reason. Okay, where are we voting? Are we you passed discussing? that one, and now you're talking okay. about the therapist. Okay. Okay. I'm still, I'm still All in right. the game. All right. Um, any other questions about HH three? All set, Amanda. It's all passed, and we voted. I didn't get an all in favor, but okay. Did we get an all in favor for HH three? I'm sorry. I answered that. No, she snuck in behind oh, you. Okay. I don't know if you wanted to jump her in so she can bounce some. Oh, you want to stay jump? We'll go through your two resolutions and she can. Yeah. Did I hear that? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I was looking for a Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. And nice. um, okay, so HH3 is set. If we could go on to HH10, and then Keith, you don't have it because it just came. There's a resolution that I'm passing out, which. Um, applies to the filling of the second um, community staff mental health social worker. Um, the old, uh, at one point when the agenda was out and these both had gone through the hiring committee, the hiring committee approved the filling of both of these um, staff social workers in an effort to you know continue the operation there. There was one on the agenda. There was some difficulty getting control yeah, members. Right. And so now um, I, I, I said something to Ray, you know, if you can obviously pull it off, let's get them done because you, you really need them filled. Yeah. Um, so HH10 is to fill one full-time staff social worker. HH11 will be the filling of the second full-time budgeted uh, social worker. And um, I'd like to entertain a motion for 10 and 11. Okay, second. second. All right. Um, any questions? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Um, since Ray is gracious enough um, and Kathleen's here and her resolutions are passed, report you want to highlight or is there any questions you have for Kathleen? Give a little update on some stuff. Um, so I did send in something in writing in advance this time. Yes, you did. So there you go. Uh, yeah. COVID continues. Um, a lot of a lot of focus this week, in particular, with schools, and, and that's a that's a really challenging aspect for those superintendents for the state. There's some areas of the state ed guidance and the state Department of Health guidance that don't mesh, and that's a real challenge for the schools that need to submit plans. But we spent quite a bit of time the last few days assisting the county school districts with writing their health and safety aspect of their plans. Um, they want to be uniform, and that's understandable. Right? That's that's important. A lot of question um, around the state whether there will be a requirement for a child to return to school to have to prove that they had a negative COVID test regardless of whether that appeared to be the issue why they weren't in school. So that's where it's, we all know that kids have, you know. Fevers and flu. Things. Yeah, right. yeah. But, you know, whether it's nerves, whether it's illness, whatever it happens to be. But 
So, and, and, and every district is doing something a little bit different also. You know, some of them have their kindergarten children going in all five days. Some of them have their junior high kids in just a couple days, so, you know, and some parents are opting to do entirely. So it's, it's, it's going to be a really challenging, challenging school year, I think. Um, but that's the way it is right now. Um, we something great that was on here that hadn't been anticipated. We got some more district money, so that was that was a really nice chunk of money over one hundred twelve thousand dollars. Also, for a district site. for a district project you did or for yeah, yeah district work we've been doing right along and and it's uh you know we we had thousands and thousands of dollars right along the way but they were in clusters of like five thousand twenty thousand something and this was this was a nice big chunk and there may be a little bit more forthcoming. Kathleen, can you just expand a little bit on that in terms of how you're using that money? And well, we're actually waiting to find out whether they're putting stipulation where we just yesterday got the letter that said how much we're getting and what we had put forward. And it is intended and somewhat for uh, for profit, well, non non hospitals, um, community based organizations with some COVID relief of some sort. But for some people, some organizations, it's gonna keep them afloat and keeping their doors open, right? But for our department, what, what are the stipulations? Does it have to be used for COVID work or can it be used, is there discretion on that? So we'll find out yeah. more. Good, we'll find out more. So it's the way to pass money through to organizations to keep, because they're, they're on this downturn. Correct. And so, support them. Right, Central New York Cares Collaborative, it, it, it is starting to phase out the whole Medicaid uh, redesign um, work is slowly coming to a conclusion and and they want to support people out there who are helping right along with um, with some of the redesign efforts that were, were going forward and we were amongst those uh, immunization clinics started their there's a lot of kids. I, I'm looking at Nancy, who's here today. There's a lot of children getting caught up, but our, our staff are doing a good job. Um, you know, and again, we're performing those a little bit differently. We always did them by appointment, but we can't just have people walking in and sitting around, right, while their appointment is. So they they have their scheduled time. Um, most people have access to a cell phone, so they call a number, and our staff member goes out, brings them in. They stay in one area that like stations people would go to, right? Register, get screen, get your shot, go home. But now it's come on in, one room, do the whole shooting right there. So it, it seems to be working, starting out pretty well. It takes more time to understand because you can't, the reason why you had stations is that you can move people through, right? And you had to extend the, the appointment time double that. So we're running them all day. I, I was curious, I noticed you wrote here that um, Dr. Joya, mm -hmm. who's a pediatrician and the part-time medical director had actually yes. assisted the department in meeting the needs of those vaccine for children kids. So, and that could happen again if you guys had to mobilize again for COVID testing, or I mean, you'd have to outsource that. Maybe, right? So he was willing. So right. we know that vaccine for children has just been a program that's been a little bit more challenging and been more and more out of that because there's such regulatory mm -hmm. aspect around it and as far as oh. even though the vaccines may come to you at no charge it costs you as the provider money to maintain those and they right. have to be kept separately than your oh, private stock you have to have your temperature taken twice a day you have to do more of a of documentation people. yeah right so unless you have a really large pediatric practice it's not financially worth your while now some will do it because it's the right thing for their clients but mm -hmm. so the health department by far sees the most number of, of people for for vaccine for children along with vaccine for adults. Um, when COVID was starting, we could not have the public. We first we right. had no time, mm -hmm. but there right. were some who couldn't wait. So the school age children, they did wait, but your new infant cannot wait for months to have their, their shots. So Dr. Joya accommodated that. We said, we have to find, let's find another vaccine for children provider of which he is one. And he is one of our backup just in case emergency if we had to, if our, we had a meltdown in our refrigerators and our 
refrigerator, our secondary, you know, if it was a total, right, he's, he's one we could borrow stock from. He's one whose refrigerator we could use. And, and, and it was, uh, if it worked well, he would see other doctors, children for that purpose only. And I thought that deserved a little recognition yeah. for everybody because he certainly didn't have to do that. And that was good for the community. And the would regulation he's... hasn't changed whether the child is going to be at home for school learning mm -hmm. or, all, or right. all of those regs have not changed the vaccination takes place. Mm -hmm. And this year is definitely the schools are not going to hedge at all. This has been our struggle the last couple of years is kind of bringing, getting them into the fold of this requirement. Well, this year they will. So the first 14 days of school is going to be when we're really going to be. Would a provider like you still be faced seeing so many Medicaid's faced with that kind of surge as well too? There, uh, most providers get a back to school research, and yeah. the school nurses, that is part of their job is to check how many children are up to date on yep. their vaccines, and it, and it is regulatory. And, we talked about this last year at this time. The state was coming down with the hammer last year. It says schools, get these kids out right. if they're yeah. not vaccinated. Right. Um, so there, there's a silver lining. Mm -hmm. You know, schools are set up to be remote. So if you don't get your kids their shots, they won't have to miss school. <laughs> right. They can right. have to log on from home. And there's less providers that are going for VFC. Yeah, that's yes. Yeah. So that's yep. the challenge it makes it difficult. Yeah. But it's definitely a worthwhile program. Uh, our lead poisoning prevention, uh, because uh, families and individuals are going back to doctor's offices more so now where there truly had been a lull for all sorts of reasons. Um, now, uptick in lead poisoning uh, referrals that we must follow up with, and that's got timelines around it. We've seen a huge uptick in our early intervention referrals as well. So. That's the hey, this is over. The, huh? that, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like like we ever had, right? Right. Uh -huh. But there there was a pause on the mandatory programs, not because we were putting the pause on them, but because people were not seeking care. Right. And so now it's it's like the tidal wave, right, of of, of coming at us, and and it's it's stressful. Um, septic system inspections have gone out. Rabies as seasonal has we've seen a little uptick. Mosquito and tick-borne uh, diseases starting to see, you know, a little more action around there. Um, we know that our neighboring county did some spraying for Tripoli and Onondaga County, which is typical for them. But that's always a reminder that you know we have to remind people not just about West Nile virus and you know, but equine encephalitis and all the other great illnesses that can be out there. So wear your bug spray when you're out there. And then harmful algal blooms. Uh, you know, we, we just put, we're putting out a press release today. Uh, fortunately, the two public water systems, so harmful algal blooms are on, they've been on Scanella, Sawasco, Cayuga, we found them, but um, just this week, um, there was some noticeable algae in the raw water mm -hmm. at the two treatment plants, but they had had their carbon treatment systems up and functioning, uh, and there was no, no detection of toxin in the finished water. So we're kind of letting people know that it's been identified in the press release and where they can go when we do the water testing is, is tested for, for the toxin, but we are not going to be sending out routine um, press releases about that. We're directing people to the website that we have where they can monitor if they have that interest. Um, it's great the DEC still has their um, website where you can see when people report balloons, it's a little more real time. Uh, and and we'll see how things go. Certainly, if if, uh, if the raw water, if we start to see an increase, we're gonna uh, more sampling, keep, keep a little more, and we keep a close eye. The water operators really are phenomenal, so that's a really good thing. Uh, so, as part of our education, a lot of times we use our schools to provide education, both for uh, vector-borne diseases, mosquito diseases, for water and paths and stuff. And we didn't have that this year, so. Um, like when we send out our septic system things, we send out half information and for, for those. Um, and those, those are kind of the highlights at the moment. There's, well, there's one more. We, we got word that we'll, we will be eligible for another grant. 
uh, related to COVID work. And we're taking a look to see what those uh, specifications are and what the requirements are. Uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to think about you know how it how it associates with what we're currently doing uh, and, and get a better game plan. We have a webinar next week where we're supposed to learn a little bit more about some of the expectations. Um, you're not required to do it, but if it fits in your mission, you will. Is that so? Well, yes, yeah, but well, if it fits in our mission and we do it, I'm going to have to come back here and I'll be talking with you guys because we're going to have to do some. We definitely will need more personnel, but this funding would accompany that. And so there would be some shifting around if we move in that direction. Is it specific to health departments? Yes. Oh, yeah, health and you can opt in to do it or not? It's it optional. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we need to learn a lot more about yeah. what the expectations are. Is it related to what's it related to? COVID. COVID-19. Uh, clearly, the state is hearing the, oh, my God, we can't do everything. Right. We do not expect us to stay on top of the early intervention timelines and the lead work and the blah, 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 the immunizations and still do this. <coughs> so we need to get continuing state. onward, right, for which we have to plan for the next year anyways. Yeah. So so it, uh, it was just we don't have good detail on, on the specifics of what is expected of us. A way to maybe support additional health department staff. Correct. And it so would they have to be new staff. Mm -hmm. But we right. did get clarity that if um, we moved current staff in there, we'd have to backfill those right. positions. Then. Right. So that would be eligible if we do that. To taste, stay tuned, right? Stay tuned. Yeah. More to come. Well, we should know a lot more next week, we hope. Anything else? Uh, yep. Hi, Joe. Yes. But it says in your report there that the rabies is bigger during the warmer months. That, so what does that equate to for this year? I don't have the number of rabies cases oh. we've had. We I can I can get that for you. We try to tally it certainly annually. Um, here's my unofficial count. I look each month at the letters that go out and January through March, the folders like this. May through September, the folders like this. Yeah. <laughs> so that gives you a sense. Is that, does that count in the numbers? But uh, we, we keep data on that. So uh, we'll yeah, that was just out. curious. So, yeah. I, I'll, I'll get to that. Just a quick question um, on the lead stuff. The, they lowered the thresholds for intervention. And I was just wondering how, how what you've seen as a result of that. That's why I think we're. we're it has just been bursting, right, with the last couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, the children might go in for their for their checkups, and then you have, you know, usually it's siblings going in. I, I think we've got some, we've done a good job, and not it's not just us. The community is more aware about lead testing, so that's the good thing. But because of the change in the blood lead levels, without question we're seeing a greater number of people who need to have a, you know a nursing contact along with the environmental assessment and we had um, you know attained grant funding to pay for a position to help with this so Allen Foundation helped it, with that uh, Emerson Emerson I know yeah. yes Emerson yeah, the did. Emerson Foundation but it, we and and we're working with um, help home headquarters which is part of a, what's the housing? Home site. Home site, yeah. Home site. Yeah, they, they are associated with home site. Mm -hmm. and so they are the actual grant recipients. We are subcontractors to that. But that got you an additional staff because you knew you were going to be. member to, yep. to work on the LED program. So she's um, getting baptism by fire right now, which worked out well because, you know, one of the positions, our senior sanitarian who had taken a new job at the beginning of the year, was one of our two lead care two certified people. So the one remaining is teaching this new employee how to do it. Now there's a big certification process that Kendra's gonna have to go through. Um, and that's simply not available for right. people to do yet. Right. Um, but at least she's learning how to assess the homes and how to interact with families. And and and, and that's a skill, right? You, you're going into someone's home. So it's not just, come in, let me zap your, your lead paint. 
And, and this was a two-year award. Is Correct. that right? I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God you. And and we're we're right up, hoping that it stays that way. That's right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy moving your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, next is the uh, human services resolutions, HH four, five, six, and seven. Maybe we could group together HH four, five, and six. Um, HH four is uh, establishing a temporary lead bank for a county department of social services employee. Kind of standard language and how the leads can be donated and what can be used and. Um, these come, you know, periodically when people are in need. Uh, HH5 is to, this also went through the hiring committee, and this is to fill four full-time casework positions in the child welfare unit in DSS. And you can see in the write-up and the attachment that they had held off since uh, March in going ahead and filling these positions. And so that has resulted in these been being the savings and them being vacant. But at this point in time, with school, you know, resuming and um, the caseloads now starting to um, creep up again, that you know, they felt it was essential that we get these caseworkers on board. It takes a year to get them fully trained and go to. So it, there's four of them, and they're asking for permission to fill all four, and it was approved through the hiring committee. And then also is the uh, asked to fill four full, full time, but they're seasonal positions in the HEAP unit. These are HEAP clerks. Um, there's temporary, there's federal funding to reimburse the cost for these, these HEAP clerks. And they explained at the meeting that there's expectation that more people will be eligible for HEAP this year than before as well. So they have the same four clerks coming back, which is great. And, um, you know, that was also approved. So if we could get a motion to group together HH4, 5, and 6. Move. Second. Okay. okay. Um, any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Uh, H7 is the authorization to fill a senior social welfare examiner position and abolish a clerk. These, this is part of the reorganization that was presented in March and sort of put on hold. Um, it did go through the hiring committee, but as I recall, there was a request to have this come forward with some additional information about the financial impact of this, making this move. So I don't know if you have. I can. Here. Okay. So you guys weren't here in 2019 and no, neither was Hans. So I want to explain to you what it is we're doing. Okay. I want to pull that resolution. You want to pull? I'm going to pull it. Okay. So we have a thing called family first legislation, which is dramatically impacting child welfare, dramatically exposes the county to all kinds of additional costs, makes the bar very high for the, um, residential placements. And the claiming that goes along with it, you know, this is for you claiming that's really at risk um, in New York State. So, so it, the whole act, and in general, the practice of, in child welfare has needed to be, has needed, has often undergoing, you know, changes in the nine years that I've been here. So we we were talking all through 2019, and I was coming up here for committee meetings, talking about all the different things that we were thinking about. And we put together a really, I think, a really solid plan that does a couple of things. One half of the plan is tightening up. The, the eligibility for people because the, when you determine the eligibility of a kid you're locked into that eligibility determination and some kids stay with us for 18 years so you could be if you don't if you don't code that right and and, and have the have the proper uh, you know supporting documentation supporting court orders and all of that sort of stuff that funding is at risk so we undergo these 4e audits all the time by the state as practice and this so, is federal that it's federal right. dollars it's 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 it, to this county it's it's like it, you have millions of dollars of exposure here over the course of any years that, that 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 kid is in is in care and preventive services that we fund right now 
also will fall under this new eligibility criteria. If we don't determine the eligibility properly, we're not going to be able to get reimbursed. So there's a ton of money at stake. And the practice needed to change too, because you know, residential RTC placements, they're expensive anyways. They're like 130, 140, 150, some I got to right now it's about $275,000 a year over in Massachusetts in a special special school and in, 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 I mean, there's just no there's just no place. So um, we don't want to put kids in residential care. I just think it's terrible for them anyways. In general, they get the worst outcomes in their life. If you look at the research, it's the most awful thing that you can do to kids, even though we do it in the interest of helping them. So the goal is to keep more kids in foster care. Foster care homes are difficult to support and maintain because a lot of the kids that go to the RTCs, they're 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. They got JD charges and all that sort of stuff. They don't get paid for pins placements anymore either. So we are, we we coming up here talking about this thing for, for for we've been thinking about it for over a year and we were formulating our thinking and we were communicating with Health and Human Services Committee. You guys weren't here for it, so that's why I'm I'm, I'm doing this. Job. The other half of that was, you know, reforming the the child welfare practice. And what we ended up doing was getting you know recruiting a reserve foster home, right? That we could uh, place kids in when they're removed, and, and it'd be like a 30 day stay. And then we were going to put an intensive focus on those placements to be able to do relative resource searches. Relative resource ser searches right now, you know, are in the moment during the removal, but you know, we're we are not able to put the bandwidth on um, or the focus or learn get the expertise to be able to continue to try to uncover relative resources because that's the best place for kids to go when they're better to live with somebody that they know, somebody that they're related to. We we've done it, we've done a pretty good job. But you really need a focus on doing that and, and then also identifying the proper placement for that kid. Like, I think there's three things that would happen with that reserve foster home and with the worker that was assigned to that, which is called permanent special, permanency specialist, which is what that resolution is drafted. And, and so if that person was going to be completely focused on that foster home, those kids that are there, and then figuring out what's the best thing. There's three best things. One is the kid can go home with this extra time that this kid's in foster care. You know the cps work and the safety planning and all of that can continue on and then maybe we can get that kid back home with supports right so that's the first thing the second thing would be relentlessly finding a, a family resource that actually can go stay with the uncle in georgia because we found the uncle in georgia you know whatever whatever works you have to have time to sort of do the investigation of the relative resource too to make sure that um you know that they're 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 that they're they're okay right and um the timelines for the what happens with safety and stuff like that doesn't always line up. You might remove the kid before you did that. Third thing is you would find the most appropriate placement for that kid if you couldn't do those two things, which hopefully would be a foster home somewhere that you could support and you know put all put all those put all those supports. And so it was it was like all of a piece. So we were coming up here to um, you know to talk about that, and so we had like Grace, she's the budget person. Jen Marshall, staff development, Christine, me, Carla, who's the director of services, came up here and did a, a very lengthy presentation, question and answer thing about putting this in the 2020 budget. We figured out a way to fund it so that all of this stuff could be funded within, within the budget without really any local impact. And then I gave something away to make it more attractive and sweeter for you guys. I did a horse trade. This is for the permanency specialist, not the social worker. For the home. I, yeah. I found the money. Instead of paying the reserve accommodation out of the DSS budget, which is the reimbursement for reserves, is like 9%. So I borrowed some 100% money that I had accrued over at mental health and paid for the foster home that way. And that was what it, so I came to the committee and said, we'll do this. This is a better deal for you saving money. The budget got passed. So we come. We do, we do the thing again in March. I think we brought all the resolutions in March, if I remember right, but then all this stuff happened. So it was like, we, 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 we pulled. I need the permanency, so I, we went to the hiring committee to, to have the discussion about, you know, the department's got, I don't know, 14 vacancies today. We had 20 people furloughed. We're just getting crushed. I got 80 kids in foster care. It's like 10 more than we had. Seven more are going to be coming in in the next couple of days. System sort of stretch, right? I got that reserve foster home, got four kids in it, and I have nobody working on moving those kids right now. So if I get to choose and pick between the the 
the, the social welfare examiner who's going to do the eligibility stuff and the training for the eligibility stuff to make that eligible, eligible, eligibility unit that can potentially save us millions of dollars, or I can take care of humans that I'm going with the humans. So I would like to pull that resolution and see if you would consider replacing it with that one to fund that position. There's zero dollar impact in the county budget. It's fully funded and I force traded for it. Okay, so let me understand. Right now, HH7 is on here and that is the senior social welfare examiner. Mm -hmm. We're gonna abolish a clerk and try to upgrade a position to look at, at the 4E eligibility stuff. Right. You're, you're asking about pulling HH7 and replacing it with reconsideration to hire the permanency special. I need to have more right now because these are, these are kids. I'll take them both, but if I got to pick, I'm taking, I need to support that foster home. We're getting slammed in foster care and we need to really prepare for family first. All this stuff was budgeted, paid for, and negotiated. So I just, wanted to let you guys know, because you weren't here, about those discussions and how we put things together. When we put things together, we don't spend county money. We figure out a way to fund it within the parameters that we have, and we did that with this. So um, that position's 62% reimbursed by the, by the state and federal government, and we did it with a zero budget impact and I threw another $36,000 in the pot and now I can't fill it. So that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about and I appreciate you indulging me with that. So that's out there. You can bring it from the floor or not, from, from the room, from the table or not, but I want to pull that resolution. You're pulling the senior social welfare examiner. Yeah. I mean, I'll take them both if you want uh -huh. to do that. They both have zero budget impact, and I'm giving up another position to try to get something I had budgeted for already. I just don't think it's fair to the department, especially when you know, these are kids. And you got millions of dollars at stake, not just next year, but every year afterwards. And if we don't get this thing right, we're going to get hurt. And I'm not going to be here, so it's not like this is for me. This is for us. This is about the, protecting the county from the liability, building a system that takes care of kids and families and does the right thing for no more money. That's important. And I'm not asking you to give me another $100,000 to do something. This is what's budgeted for and we force traded for it. So okay. that's the deal. And, and at the hiring committee, there was discussion about looking at the senior social welfare examiner instead of transferring another one from a different department but looking at that and kind of looking at the financial impact there was also discussion honestly about could this this has been on it, it was funded you're absolutely right it has been unfilled up until now so that's nine months of salary savings if, by the time it gets filled if it became part of your um still priorities then there should be potential reconsideration for it but yeah. My, my only my only question this is going to be i see the merit of it it's going to be an upgrade of an existing position probably a senior to go to a grade b so that there could be dedicated time to look at these kind of issues around permanency we're not able to put that kind of a focus on it yeah but until you get this core set of caseworkers on board and staffed and functioning, how do you take the current caseload? Of, can you take the current caseload away from this permanency specialist and sort of redesign it so that there will be those attentions? Is that? So I guess my answer to that is your your job as a legislature is policy. But what, what we do in the department with our staff and how we move them around and how we deploy them you have the, is, is an issue for us to resolve. No, but my question is you have the ability if this upgrade happens to do just that i think what it does now is because you know things change mm -hmm. people change people have emerged in different you know some leadership you know that people are growing the, what we might have done before it's like if we were going to fill this in january mm -hmm. what our thinking was with the personnel shuffling that we were mm -hmm. going to do then is different now mm -hmm. we, we, we we think we, we landed in a better place with sort of understanding you're right, we don't have a lot of people to allocate and move around because of the vacancies. Right. We also have probably of the 40 caseworkers that are up there, 
probably 12 of them have been there less than a year and right. a half, less than two years. And we, we terminated probation on, on some people that we didn't, that, that was like what you guys were talking about, like the, the, the shelf life of a resolution and all that sort of stuff. We're not as um, deep as we might have been yeah. or we used to be, but that's not a reason to, 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 to like the work of preparing for family first and realigning the child welfare practice will still needs, needs to, to start and it never ends. So the yep. longer we put off starting it, the less likely we are to be able to line up with 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 the deadlines and you know meet the you know be in a position as a department to do the right thing by kids. And if we aren't able to do the right thing by kids, they get hurt. And then you're paying to hurt them more than you are today, which this is the way I see it. Like this is this is me just looking at it like that's kind of nuts, mm -hmm. right? That we would spend more money to do a worse thing. And that's really what this becomes in terms of um, what the what in, in the legislation, I can't even argue against it. I think it's forcing you not to stick kids in residential treatment centers for 15 years. Right. Right. Spend two million dollars and have them not have a high school education, not have them know how to read and write, not them have any, that's just crazy stuff. So that's a conversation. You guys weren't here for that. I know you know it intuitively, you know what I mean, in terms of because of how you, you know, what I know about you both as, as, as the work that you've done, but we really set the table for this. This this is a budgeted item that we fought really hard to put in. And Charlie was there for the discussion, you were there, and Keith was there, and, and you guys are like new. So I want to, it's just too important to let go. So I know I know that this is out of the ordinary and probably pissing some people off, but in general, I gotta advocate for what's right for the department. It's my yeah. story and I'm sticking to it. Can I ask a question? You can ask me any question you want, but you gotta talk a little loud. <laughs> so you mentioned horse horse trading one position for another if they're both fully funded or it, is it so when we talked about this in yeah. in, in the budget like you so you guys haven't gone through that yet so typically we come and we say you know you get the budget and then we we present and we say this is the stuff that we want to do for the next year you know kind of here's why and here's what it costs so when we were having this discussion see like it's funny because it's like it's interesting how 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 that how this sort of stuff gets interpreted but this is just how how how, how my mind works so so we're having this discussion about the you know how what we want to do we, we want this reserve foster home we want these things are all important. At least this is well thought out stuff by a lot of people, right? They're like, we're in the room all the time talking about this stuff, trying to figure it out and doing this right thing. So in the middle of this, we put it into budget and stuff like that. You know, I, you know, I Grace, Grace is like, well, so no. Grace is like, well, wait a minute, you know, the reimbursement for this um, reserve foster home, which I thought we would be able to use a rate for, you know what I mean? I'm thinking we can use a rate for, so it's not gonna be that bad. It's like, you, you really, it's like 9% rate. This is a problem, we gotta jump through all these hoops. And I'm like, oh, how about I just fund it with 100% money. So then I, we come back in the budget discussion, like I can kick this $36,000 and make the deal even better so you can feel more comfortable about voting for it as a legislature. And we were like, yeah, so it, like, it happens that way sometimes. It's like, in, I, it's I, always I, like that. I totally recall the conversation. Yeah. The, the permanency specialist didn't get approved in the budget process as an additional position. He came here and he said, I really need it. I'll, I'll increase my revenue for state aid or something in mental health mm -hmm. to offset the local share to the county and cover the cost for this if you give me the thing. And then the, the whoever was around the Ways and Means Committee said, okay. I, but I mean, they yeah. moved the money. We moved the money for mental health. And that's do, what do he meant by the horse trade. To pay this Initially, it didn't get through. Okay. That's, 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 like, that's like dream stuff. So I got to ask myself, you know, I'm just hanging up with you guys now. I got to ask myself, if I put a deal like that together and we figure all that out and it doesn't get funded, or we can't, what's the rules? Are we supposed to just ask for more? Like if I came and said, it's another $200,000, would I be more likely to get it funded or get it approved? Or am I supposed to continue to save money and put stuff on the table and then not get the end of the bargain held up on the other side? So I wonder about that. We're all wondering about that. Get the financial stuff, but this is what we do all the time. Figure stuff out and you make it work. But Nine months of salary savings it, on this thing. It, and if you're asked, basically what you're asking is consideration to move this resolution and replace it with the other. 
if in, in feeling, the order of priority. If your feeling is you're only going to give me one of the two, that's the more important one. The other one doesn't cost any money either. The the the, the, the social welfare exam. Plus, I'm giving you a position. Why would I do that? Why would I give you a position again and then not get me done? Because that's kind of what it feels like. Awesome. So, yeah. I mean, Elaine, may I ask? Yep. The, I'm curious about a about a couple of couple of things, and and one is 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 the, um who on your staff is still on furlough? I thought all the furloughs were called back. They are all called back, but I'm just giving you the idea of what the last year is. Okay, got it. Because I thought you said that you had you had X number of people still on furlough. Okay, that's question. Oh, number two. Um, question number two is 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 that the. Uh, the, the mental health budget, the state aid is is uh, um, the okay. you're suggesting that that will pay for this position, and you're also suggesting that there's that extra hundred and more thousand in the, the nonprofit no. So we count the same money twice. That's the so like Kathleen was up here talking about district money that she she received. We've received like a ton of district money, which I've been able to put into a reserve account. And this is an authorized expenditure in the mental health budget in terms of the CFR to be able to say, I'm paying for a reserve bed for kids. So OMH, who's, who, you know, so I signed the CFR and it goes to, to Jill at OMH. I'm like, Jill, can I use this money for this? Nope, that's, you can use it for this, go ahead. So Lynn moved $36,000 out of this account into a, a reserve account at DSS and then out of that account every month, pay the, pay the reserve to the family. So it's not state aid, it's money that we earned for other projects that we did and we're using it now for the, um, you know, my budget, we cover our expenses. So I don't have to put that in there and I used it to do this. And I think that that's the sort of flexible, creative stuff that we do all the time that I think has become so routine that it doesn't feel how cool it is. Yeah. Okay, and my, 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 my next question is, is, is that we met, um, three days ago, and uh, um, none of this came up in terms of price. This was all discussed, none came up. What has changed between Monday and today that makes the, the, this position now the priority and the senior um, the senior not the priority? And number two, the idea was, since this kicks in, the, the family first stuff kicks in in January, the idea was is, is to look at, and this probably is a priority for the county, but to look at overall county priorities and if, in fact, this becomes a priority for the county, which I suspect it probably will, once those 2021 budget discussions identify county priorities, then at that point, it makes sense to fill the, uh, the, um, the permanency specialist um, this year prior to the 2021 budget. But until we know what the county, I, I understand what you're saying. I don't disagree. But they, until we know what the, the priorities are in the age of COVID and the reductions, we don't know what everything is going to be needed. And if we're ma we make decisions now that have an impact on 2021 without the without through that, it's it's uh, that puts us in a, di a very difficult position. So I think those are the um, but I'm interesting for that's just a, a comment. But I'm interested from you. What has changed between Monday and now that no, all of a sudden it comes up? I, I mean, I don't know what to say to all that stuff. So this has been a priority. It's been discussed. We pitched it all on Monday. It was your guy's choice not to fill it. Yeah. We didn't say, forget the permanency specialist. We pitched it. And, you know, the reason why you're hearing this now is because I've been stewing on this and we've all been stewing on this for three days. So we pitched it. This will be the fourth time now. And we funded it. And it was a priority in 20. It's still going to be a priority in 20. It doesn't change anything. And, 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 and the county priorities it really don't matter to me. What matters is, can we do what we need to do that costs nothing? So yeah. it costs nothing. It, 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 well, the county priorities have to matter to us. I mean, as you said, the, as oh, you made it, I appreciate you advocating for what you need. That's, that's your job. And our job is to look at the larger, the larger issues. You're absolutely right. I totally agree with you. And, 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 you know, Keith, the, thing I'm, the thing I'm hearing is if there is a decision that he'll, that one senior wel welfare examiner gets created and filled, 
in instead of a permanency specialist he wants them both but he's saying i want the permanency specialist more in the list of priorities if i have to pick if you're going to give me one and that me i mean both. that's that's what i'm hearing him say that's yeah, yeah. That. did you right the other thing just an appointed appointed yeah. order, we can pull this resolution what we can't do is substitute that we have no mechanism to substitute. The only way that can be done is on the floor of the legislature next Tuesday. So if, if we want to pull this, then it would have to come to the floor next Tuesday. Okay. And, New resolution, whatever it would be. And not to win. So a committee member can't make a resolution that it could be. It's not the way it works. And you guys know the rules. I just make it my pitch. You've got to do what you think you got to do. And you know, we're going to keep trying to keep the lid from blowing up every day. Because the lid is coming off. And I don't come up here and just ask for stuff. So one more thing I want to talk to you guys about, just really briefly. We got about $325,000 from some, um, you know, the COVID sort of money geared towards eviction prevention. So, um, we met with the, you know, like uh, Kathleen was there. And so the plan, I submitted the plan today and we're gonna use $100,000 of that money for, there's this, there's this for prevention, which means like, I think that there's people out there, you know, so if their income is below like, it's half of some word. So it's about $24,000 here in Cuba County. So if somebody has a, an income of $24,000 or less. So we don't know them on public assistance. You know what I mean? This is like a renter who's been working someplace, but got jammed up, can't pay their, and they're, and they're behind. And um, so $100,000 of that money can be used to pay arrears, back rent, stuff like, there's a bunch of rules around it. You know what I mean? And then the other $225,000 is going to go for uh, rapid rehousing, which is going to be really trying to get people out of motels. Um, get you know the, the really high risk homeless people is sort of where that but i wanted to make some money aside for folks who we don't normally know about we have the flexibility to move money across the two like if we needed more in one we could take it from the other and stuff like that we're going to otda is going to do a direct contract with cap we picked cap because they have rapid rehousing and they're doing a lot of this stuff for us anyway so i didn't want to like reinvent the wheel and and they can they can start it up really quick so um but you know that money's guaranteed it, and then that's the first round and they're saying, so that money's good to like 2020, 20, two, like two years of money, 2022. And then there's gonna be another round of, of that same sort, sort, sort of funding. So Judge Thurston, you know, we're, we have something set up with him too. He's interested because he, you know, the city court is gonna get the bulk of the evictions. And so he wants to, we're gonna be a partner with him to sort of one, try to get people not to go to court, start reaching out to landlords and stuff like that. So we got some, some help with that. We still got about $150,000 in step money, which is solutions to end homelessness that we can use for rapid rehousing. So we haven't had to use that money because no one's being evicted because of the, the executive order. But, you know, I've been talking to landlords and there's quite a few people who are going to get evicted. Yeah. So um, when is the moratorium still in? It, well, it's lifts September 4th or 5th or something like that. So that's when the executive order that, he, that the governor just did for 30 days expires. There's some federal stuff going on. I don't know what's going to happen with that, but it's, I mean, sorry, you just can't do this to landlords forever either. You know well, I mean? and that rethinking how homelessness that I listened to the webinar and that is exactly what they're talking about. Having this grassroots effort to avoid that court hearing, yeah. to avoid the eviction, to try to do a settlement with a landlord, because you can't just tell them they're you know, you don't put them under too. No, so, yeah, right, right. right. But yeah. So, so, I mean, we, you know, we work with a lot of landlords and, um, you know, Judge Thurston's a good partner. Yeah. We got good partners and we're going to try to, we're going to try to like, you know, head off the, the, the awfulness of, but there was like, one of the lamps told me there was, there, she had seven people on the docket for the, for the housing eviction court the day the court closed. So those cases oh. are going to get heard now. They're on, they've been redocketed sometime in september so that stuff's going to start happening again i think we got to help people who aren't the traditional dss recipients as well too so that's what the that's what the hundred thousand right. dollars was quite a bit of flexibility with it we are not but the rules are kind of funny like they, like they almost have to have an eviction letter from the court 
to, to be eligible to prove that they're right. kind of going to be evicted instead of like, well, the landlord says I'm going to be evicted. I need four grand. So, Ray, will that, keep it posted. will that be managed? Um, will the prevention stuff be managed out of um, DSS or? No, the whole thing's going to gonna go over there. Oh, what, okay. what, what we've set, what we're going to want to set up is what we talk about is publishing a, a, like their caps number as a hotline if you're going to be evicted or you're uh, worried about being evicted or you need some sort of help call this number so we want to push everybody to them they know how to figure out when somebody and we got tools that the seat so the continuum of care the coc stuff is the swigo we got you know swigo onondaga and swigo onondaga and, and us sorry the, 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 that's the continuum of care and, and they're like the hud the money from HUD kind of flows through there. They develop some eligibility tools for other three counties to use as well. So CAP will, so that'll tell you if somebody's, if TA should do it, if, if they're eligible for the COVID, if they're eligible for CDBG, or we can do it with triple FS, or, you know, we've got some other kind of pots of money. So the idea is to match up everybody exactly where they need to be so we can use all the, the pies and not like get jammed by running out of something because we didn't, we could have used it that way, but we shouldn't have. We should have did this. So we're not set up for that, and they are. So there's a really good partnership with the third floor and those guys anyways, and we got Shane in the middle of all that stuff. So I feel pretty good about um, – plus they can do it quickly. I don't need a resolution. It's a direct contract with them and OQDA. We don't have to go through all of that stuff, and mm -hmm. that'll just be a lot better and a lot, lot more efficient. So then you don't take a cut here. You don't take a cut there. It all goes to people. And so it's free money. Great. Yeah. Great. So that's the rest of my story, and I'm sticking to it. Great. <laughs> you guys, got any questions for me about anything outside of like my babbling? Are you guys um, doing any outreach to try to get us? You said you talked to a lot of landlords and stuff like that, but um, so I, so the judge is including some some landlords. Part of our plan, you know, this money's not going to flow until the end of September. So we're still like in the planning, but the plan is. Is to, is to is to is to you know so Monica right and Monica's great so she's going to help us push this information out. Um, we're going to talk to Kerstetter because he's the like there's some loosely collected landlord kind of group. They're not all part of it, and um, so I think when we're the, the the targeted push is going to be to let everybody know that's just an encouraged landlords to call. Like for instance, say you know I got a couple of people that might be a good idea. And then we can, and then cap. They're going to be able with the money. You know, so they already got case managers that work there now. So they'll add another one. So they've got the they'll have a, like a critical mass to be able to respond. Because I want the response to happen. I don't want it to be a phone call back in four days. Right. Like we we're just we're slammed here, and that's what will happen is it'll be on somebody's voicemail, and it'll go to ten different people, and one number, one call. Plus, they've got all those other services they can help people with. They've got, you know, you know, they got emergency food. They got, they got all that stuff. So they can really do a nice. We can take care of you and help you out and make sure your needs are, are, are all set. So that's kind of made sense. I figure they can make the lift. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Lori's been, been, they're pretty good at this housing stuff. So we have some confidence in that. Great. That's good stuff. I think you know. How much dollars? Three twenty-five. Only two thousand dollars of that's got to go to the COC for the HMIS reporting, which is the system mm -hmm. that all this information goes into, yep. and you can identify people's risk for homelessness that are in there, and you know, you know who's in shelters and, and stuff like that via that system. So it's coming together really nicely. You know, everybody's interested in doing the right thing and, and really rallying around this, so we're pretty excited. Okay. That's, any I mean, other this is just the way it is. Yep. So right. By uh, by striking HHS seven, is that the, the yeah, yeah. senior? Okay. Um, and looking what you've at what you've just proposed, would we be then looking at a resolution? Oh, he has a draft resolution here, and what I'm hearing is oh, okay. that if if this is there's interest in doing this, then it could be presented on the floor uh, for consideration. Okay. I was that kind of yeah, I was hoping to convince the, the, the committee to feel the same way about it as I do. And well, I would like to look at it. Yeah, and I'm you know, you guys got questions, 
you want to talk to us, this is the uh, we can, we'll be happy to do that. Like I said, we've worked and spent a lot of time on, on, on this, and it really is it's um, not can, something that can wait. Like the readiness, we're already behind. I personally would like to consider both of them. They, I, I remember when you presented your plan. We were um, up here. Yeah, yeah and then up. here as okay. well. And I remember the process and the conversations internally with the staff and the planning and all of that that did go mm -hmm. go through. And this is a different time and different budget period and everything. But these are these are preventative services for the most part and are covered. And this is the time where we want to be involved in somebody's life cycle is early on so that we're, that, yeah, exactly, kids. You invest at this stage, at this age, it's gonna prevent a lot of stuff down the road and further costs down the road. I'm hopeful so, that this is better way to do child welfare than what we and other counties have been doing. That's I, believe it's transformational. I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't care what put the time in. I don't have much time. So, Elaine, Elaine, may I just repeat? So Go ahead. You, 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 I, I think the way it works, you can pull the res resolution. I don't think the department head can. Are you pulling the resolution or do you need a motion to table? I, I was going to, at this point, given Trisha's uh, thought. I mean, do you have the ability to identify another senior welfare examiner somewhere else in the department to help start training on this work without filling this at this moment? I mean, just asking. I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, because I, I, I mean, if you don't have capacity to do that and there's interest in having us vote on HA7, um, what I'm hearing is I can't, I don't know about introducing the other resolution, but I mean, I, I technically maybe that's why I need it as a council. Here, here's council. Mm -hmm. Well, I I can tell you how how I've done this in the past, and and um, that is that if there if you want to introduce a late resolution, it's not so much a substitute, but it's a late resolution. Yeah. And if you know, the committee agrees unanimously that they're willing to accept a late resolution that was just presented to you in the last 10 seconds. Um, you have that, you have that ability. There's two options, As, right? I mean, I, I agree with Keith right. that, no, there's no means of swapping, it out. swapping, but you could introduce a late resolution if, you know, if the committee was willing to accept it. So you would need, you know, a motion to, accept a late resolution to waive the rules with respect to accepting a late resolution. And then uh, you would have a second uh, vote on the resolution itself. So, so if the committee decides, chooses to vote on HH7, the senior welfare examiner and not have it pulled, we can entertain a motion to move it and second it and see how it goes. If there's, if the committee has the, um, if it's the committee's pleasure to entertain a late resolution, the create and fill of a case supervisor grade B permanency specialist that was budgeted in the 2020 budget, we could do that. Oh. You could. So what's the pleasure of the committee? Yeah. I think we have to move seven. Move seven and, and decide whether we'll bring the permanency specialist to the floor or not. Okay, I'll second that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, can uh, we get a vote on filling HH7, which is the senior social welfare examiner position, and abolishing a clerk uh, to accomplish the 4E oversight? Aye. 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 Kate? Yeah, I'm confused about what we're doing. So, I have to, I was in support of this, but I have to vote no. You're voting no for HH7? I don't understand what we're doing, yes. Okay, I'll vote yes. So that'll go to Ways and Means for further discussion. And then we'll have further discussion about whether we're introducing the permanency specialists on the floor. I just think that you guys should, department should be able to talk to the committee about what they want to do. And after the discussion, it's different. 
-hmm. when you don't want to do something as opposed to not having a discussion. Feels different. Okay. I guess my only question procedurally, the, uh, the ATF that's attached to the Senior Social Welfare Examiner, or no? No, to the that's attached to the Permanency Specialist, which is the late resolution that we're not entertaining right now. That you're not entertaining right, right now, might I mean okay. before it's presented to the okay. floor, has the ATF been approved by HR? Would be one question. She did. She did. Yeah, Lisa. Okay, she, I have, did, she did approve it. As okay. Yeah, I would. I, a, you should be in on that email, I guess, if you're in. Okay. Well, I. Yeah, Lisa did. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't make it that I fill it, but it just approves it. Right. Yeah. And the okay. hiring committee just didn't go through the hiring. Did not, no, well, this, we went this, to the, but they didn't. didn't this, pass this, along. this was, he said initially, um, something that if it made it was going to be continue to be a a priority for the budget that and it fit in the 2021 budget, there would be consideration to filling it prior to the end of the year after the budget was presented. That's, I think is that a fair assessment of how we left it? Yeah, I think it was was even prior to the budget presented, but at the point at which which Aileen Lynn and the budget people um, confirmed that knew it was going to be a priority that it would be reconsidered at that point. So certainly earlier than the approval of the. So we are looking at in that respect at a delay of of you know I don't know six weeks or so, but. That we can discuss that in on the floor if that's what people choose to do. Okay. All right. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Yep. Okay, uh, Brenda, you've been hanging in there. Oh my God! No, she was there. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, Brenda, I'm here. Okay. Is there anything you want to highlight in your report? Uh, no, but after listening um, to Kathleen and, and um, uh, Ray, I just wanted to, to express my gratitude for all that they do for the community. They, um, you know, I, I, I just appreciate it. I just want to say that. Um, as far as our office, we just keep doing what we're doing. Um, we did successfully get, um, distribute uh, almost 800 coupons. Um, throughout the county, we were down south in Southern Cayuga, we were up north in Fairhaven, we did them all as a drive through and uh, that went quite well. Just like everything during COVID, all of our staff have been involved, they all helped with the deliveries, they all helped with the mask distributions, they all helped with the, uh, farmer's market coupons, so um, that's something probably wouldn't have and it's um, a um, years. Um, the other thing I just want to mention, in addition to what I had down there, is that um, yeah. I'm report really grateful that um, we just recently received a total of $1,200 in memorial donations um, mm -hmm. from our long term um, volunteer. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think that just an amazing outpouring of honor for that individual and support for our program so um, I, that's what I was doing while I was listening is is um, telling the <laughs> any questions or anything for me any just just one quick one Brenda this is Trish um, I know at one point you were building up building a program for seniors for social um, social calls and outreach, uh, I believe. I was wondering. Yeah, that ended up being a short-term project to get people over the first two or three months of significant COVID isolation. We found that as the weather improved, people had a lot more contacts than they did originally. And um, so we found that they really were kind of too busy and had other things to keep them occupied and weren't really interested in the ongoing calls. So that's on hold at the moment, and we'll see if this fall or winter that's something that we need to look at again. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. All right.
We do have an executive session. Sorry. Yeah. Um, do we need a motion for executive session? Can someone make the motion for executive session? I'm a second. Okay. All right. And that's to discuss the employment history of a particular person. Elaine, will you be doing any business after this? No. All right. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Amanda, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. You know, Amanda, as always, could you just hang around for an hour or two just in case I have a question? <laughs> so I'll just uh, just chill out at home and wait for you to finish. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. I couldn't resist that. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Yep. And also, actually, Rick, here's a question for you. Yeah. Are there is there is, is there a quorum there? Uh, there's four of us, and you. Okay. So I can I can disconnect, go to the executive session, and not worry about reconnecting for the adjournment. I don't know what that means. Try that again. I I think he you're. He wants to know if he'll be able to uh, once he leaves again this session. Does he have to join back into this one? Will there be a quorum to adjourn? Oh, how many are in the committee? Eight? Seven. Seven. So Seven. We, need we need four. We have four. So we'll have a quorum. Very good. But there so I'll see you. I'll see you guys. In. Thank you. Yeah. Going back in okay. There. Yeah. I'm reading today. So I don't know what I did. When I, um, Brittany, are you going to end the live feed on YouTube? Um, typically, we leave it up until we come back in and then no, do the adjournment. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, gotcha. We're going to do that. See you. Okay, so we're going to go dial the uh, back. Yep. Never done on that. Oh, my gosh. Gosh.
you go and uh, they said, oh, I forgot to tell you, the race we gave you last year, that was a mistake. So this year your reappointment is up and but then I creep back up after that. I mean it was not one little glitch in the system. Led to death. Oh my God. It's a mess. <laughs> All right. Um, can I just ask for a motion to adjourn? Well, we got to go back on the record first. Are we on the record? Yeah. Okay. So we're back on the record. Okay. So, yeah, make, make the motion. Um, could I get a motion to adjourn? Well, before we do that, I thought you wanted to put the committee support. Oh, the committee support on the record? That yeah. Yes, that, you know, the, there was uh, full Health and Human Services support to uh, move forward with the reappointment of Kathleen Cuddy, and that we'll be moving the resolution for further discussion um, to Ways and Means this month for compensation. Okay, now can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you. <laughs> there we go.